Dr. Robert Heisinger, so um, first question before I ask you anything else is the question based upon the fact that you've not only been my doctor for 40 years, but you're one of my pals. Are you doing okay? How are you doing? No, I'm doing great. It's, um, it's weird because it's, it's always a little bit scary when you read in the paper, 62 Italian doctors have died. Multiple doctors have already died here, emergency room doctors, frontline responders. But I don't know, it, it hasn't really hit because this is a little bit scary, but I just always have to remind people compared to the HIV epidemic back in the early 80s when we were basically intubating, caring for patients. We didn't know what the name of the disease was. We didn't have a test to see who had it. We didn't know how it was spread, but we knew it was killing everybody 100%. That was a lot more scary. I was I was scared then. This doesn't really I, it doesn't really affect me. Really? Okay. Yeah. Um, but in terms of the overall, so my first question is: as of today, March thirty first, um, tell me from your perspective, where are things today in terms of the, the Los Angeles area where you practice, and also just based upon what your colleagues are telling you nationwide, like where are we at today? Well, nationwide, I'm hearing from doctors in New York, and it's it's they're close to a panic mode, and you know all the doctors there are taking that triple therapy that everybody has probably read of. They're all almost assuming they have the disease because they got so inundated with individuals coming to their office where maybe up to a quarter or more of them were already infected, and so they're they're kind of assuming they're infected and they're starting on this antibiotic prophylactically. I think that's a hot spot. Describe what that is for people who don't know what it is. Well, the triple therapy is something that really, I mean, things move so fast and are so fluid nowadays, came out literally last Friday, the 20th, and uh, a French doctor did an incredibly small, very lousy in scientific terms study because it wasn't well controlled. But one little interesting subarm was six out of six patients that were given zinc, azithromycin, and this drug called plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine they all had literally within a six day period, a drop in their viral titers. And they didn't even really report how the symptoms correlated with that, but it was so seductive that I basically started putting on all my patients on that protocol that were at high risk for having complications. Uh, it's hard to get that stuff, unfortunately, because there was a run on it, kind of just yeah. like there was a run on toilet paper. But um, I put all my patients on that. And you know, we've had some successes, but also some notable failures. So it's an evolving field. But anyway, New you York is put, a hot spot. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you only put your patients on it who you considered were most vulnerable. Because like, I'm your They're patient. Most vulnerable, correct. Because most of the people, thankfully, that are, you know, 32, by the time my tests come back, which may be three to four days, and a couple of weeks ago, it was a lot longer than that when the labs were inundated with these tests. And, and we had wait time were a week. But by the time I could call young patients back, they were already fine. They had no symptoms. So that kind of gives you an idea that, you know, indefinitely somewhere around 80, but I believe much closer to 90% of the cases, it just is a passing fancy. But, you know, it's the 10% that has us, you know, pretty weak. Right. Um, speaking of that, suppose... I were to actually, Richard, just let me finish my thought because I'm so yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, New York is a hot spot. You asked how are things going in LA. LA is kind of a warm spot. It's not really heated up here at all. We certainly have it in every city and every part of Los Angeles, but it hasn't it it hasn't intensified here uh, based on our current numbers. How are you? Uh, where are you at? Because when we first were in touch about this, when it was really becoming. Uh, you know, what I'm going to call panic mode a few weeks ago, you had no tests, the, the pretty much nationwide, the, the availability of tests was quite a failure. Where are you at? Where are you personally at? And where well, are you, I mean, to, you to give you an idea of how America failed, the, the first case in South Korea was essentially a day away from the first case in America, which was up in Seattle, as you remember. Right. And within the first month, South Korea did 75,000 tests. America did 532 tests. That's why when you look at the statistic from South Korea, they were able to very early on pull up their public health system to find positives, isolate them, and, and put a, a loop around this whole infective disease. In America, we didn't do that. We let it just 
uh, percolate unseen. And that's why we're in the predicament we're in right now. Did South Korea institute the kind of um, um, stay at home uh, social yes, South Korea did, did, according to the World Health Organization's recommendations, did a moderately draconian move to keep everybody in to social distance while they were tracing not only the positives, but all the contacts of the positives. And so that turned out to be very, very effective for them. Gotcha. One of the things that I'm concerned about is, are the, is the amount of people, and you can either just speak to this to, to dissuade my concern or enforce it. There, are, it seems from the, the information that we're getting, and by the way, this is such a moving target. Like every day there seems to be different information or like a couple of days ago, you, you were hearing doctors and scientists say this, but maybe it's evolved now. Like Fauci today saying, you know, he's thinking about like having everybody wear a mask if you leave your house. My question is, for those people, with, and it seems like there's probably a large number of people who are asymptomatic, who have the virus, but are completely asymptomatic, a couple of questions. How long, if you, if you never have symptoms, how long will the virus stay with you? And, and once it goes through you, are you still contagious? Well, we wish we had the answer to all those. I mean, we have a little bit of a peek into it from Remember all the people on that cruise ship that got the virus? Yeah. And they tested essentially the whole boat and they found out a big chunk of them, you know, uh, maybe a, a fifth of a quarter were asymptomatic. But most of those, I understand, eventually develop some symptoms, albeit, you know, mild. So typically people will get symptoms, but they may not be overwhelming. And there are some true asymptomatic people that will never have a symptom. And we worry, you know, what percent of the population is that? And are those the typhoon Marys that are really, you know, spreading things? And that's why when everyone social distances, you, you take that out of the equation. But we don't really know how long it persists. I can tell you, I've had some people that tested positive the first week of this month, and they're still positive now, even though their symptoms went away in three days. So we know it's a little bit of a problem. But here's something else. And again, this just shows you know, the naivety of us doctors at this stage is when we test somebody, let's say I just had a girl the other day that was tested positive something like three weeks ago, and she's still positive, is what we're detecting. We're detecting this really sensitive uh, reverse um, RNA. Are we detecting just pieces of the virus? Are we detecting sluggish dead virus? Are we detecting really aggressive, potentially infectious virus. And we don't even know that yet. So, wow. you know, there's positive and then there's infectious transmissible positive, and we haven't fully figured that out yet. What, how is that gonna change? Is there any indication of what, uh, is there any indication that the, the information and the ability to, to better understand this disease in the medical community is coming as fast as we need it to? Well, I think Ricardo, there is like a, a game changer that's right on the horizon within the next week or so, and that's an antibody test. So you could come in to me and say, hey, have I been exposed to this? Am I immune to it? And you might have been one of those symptomless carriers that had it in the end of February, right. and you're completely immune to it now. A lot of people have had weird, you know, three or four day illnesses, and that may have been a very benign minor case of COVID, and now, if I demonstrate that you have the antibodies, you can go out and work on the front lines. You can do these swabs without putting a mask on and without having to waste all this protective gear that we're running out on. So if we can find the healthcare providers that are immune, if we can find the people that are immune, you can go out and start up our economy again. You can work full time. Right. And we just have to keep back the people that are really at high risk and maybe wait until we've proven an effective treatment or got the, the vaccine going. Okay, but if you know that once you've had the disease and you and it's it's pretty conclusive that you then become immune to it, and I'm sorry if this sounds like a really stupid question, but does it also guarantee that you're not contagious if you're in, just because you're immune to it? Correct. If you've got antibodies to something, you probably are immune to it, and you probably can fight it off if you're re-exposed from another person, at least for a season or two. Right. You know, it may not be long lasting, but you know, if you've got the right antibodies. But again, that's all speculative and we haven't, you know, we haven't put that in stone yet. Okay. Um, one thing I've noticed in the last 48 hours uh, that everybody's noticing by paying attention to, you know, keeping up, up to date with 
as much information as we get, is that it seems in the last 48 hours to me that now we're seeing, we're hearing about more children dying. We're, we're hearing about people in their 20s and their 30s. They're like, where, whereas a, even a week or 10 days ago, there still was this narrative that this is a real concern for the elderly, for people with immune, who are immune com compromised. Um, is that still true? Or has this thing now moved in a direction where you guys are saying, look, this can affect anyone, anytime, anywhere? I think that, you know, there, there are incidences, there are individual cases that are going to be outliers, um, but you have to put that in perspective. You know, young people die, you know, there are young people that die of drug overdoses. There are young people dying every day. You know, people have to put in perspective. And I'll, I'll ask you, Richard, what do you think on an average day before the COVID pandemic, how many Americans died every day? I have no idea. I don't know. I have to look it up. Because you know, I mean, today we're talking about several hundred, you know, are dying every day from COVID. Right. But basically, seven and a half thousand people die every day in America on average. Okay. So you have to recognize what those numbers are. And that's why I, I, I take a little bit of, you know, you know me, I'm an exercise fanatic. Okay. Yeah. So I take a little bit of umbrage when I'm told by our national advisors, don't go to national parks, don't go to the beach. Don't go outside in your parks because this is, this is a danger. When you talk about a viral spread, yes, inside rooms, you know, things can stick and stay. But when you're outdoors, when there's a little bit of a breeze, when you're doing social distancing outdoors by six feet, that is not, in my mind, a risk whatsoever. And what I know as a fact is about 20,000 people die every month from lack of fitness, overweight, and eating poorly. So when we're telling people, don't get fit, don't do interesting exercise, don't go outside and, um, and exercise and stay fit. I think we're sending a very bad message. And I think this is an instance where we're throwing out the baby with the bathwater. I understand because in your, to, to that specific point, what you're saying is that by doing that, you're discouraging, you're actually encouraging potential more sickness and death from a, by other means, but but that said, if I may argue with that, you know, me being obese and not working out isn't going to affect another person. It's going to only affect me. And so, while as long as the as long and and in my opinion, uh, the reason that maybe the message has been so uh, iron fisted lately is because. You and I are sensible people. You and I are going to be like, look, yeah, we're, I'm, out, I'm out exercising too, but I'm being really, really careful and I'm not doing it as much as I would normally do it. Most people would hear that and go, we're just, let's just go. Let's just go back to normal. And they won't social distance and they won't be responsible. And I think it's a real tricky argument to make either way. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll argue back at you, Ricardo, because I'll say that one of the reasons why people are dying of COVID-19 is they're overweight and underfit. And we know that the older you are, the better fit you are. You know, it's not how old you are on your driver's license. It's how old you are in the inside of your cells. You've studied and exercise for Exercise and ideal weight gets your apparent age down. So if we want to slow the COVID death rate down, we better encourage people to exercise. And to encourage people to exercise, we have to put it in a frame where it's more acceptable and there is nothing wrong with people running on trails and one person goes off the trail to the right, the other goes off the trail to the left. There is nothing wrong with getting out in parks and running and exercise and going to the beach and staying uh, six feet away from everybody else in your sphere. There is nothing wrong with that in my humble opinion. I think that that toothpaste is probably not going back in the tube anytime soon, however, don't you think? Say that one more time. I don't think that that particular toothpaste is going back in the tube anytime soon because- Possibly not, but I think that we have to recognize relative risks. And I think the relative risk of not exercising is very steep and we have to really, you know, it's one thing about pinning people indoors and the psychiatric consequences from that. But I think we need to look at health recommendations from every angle. This is, you know, think about the day when we said no one should eat fat. Fat is bad for you. So people switch to carbohydrates. It was a well-intentioned total country health recommendation that had, that had horrific long-term consequences. I don't want to go down a similar path, although this is obviously much different, 
but that gives you an idea. You have to be careful when you're making broad, overarching recommendations. Right, but wouldn't you, okay, so then maybe, would, would devil's advocate be, um, for at least for now, until we know even more, work out harder than you normally do, but at home? Or in yeah, your yard. I think yard. most people can't work out at home, you know, and it, it, it's very difficult. You have to get outside. Working out at home is a nightmare. People don't have equipment. People don't have the ability to work out at home. You can, and I got to say, one of my heroes, Jack Elaine, uh, one of his shticks was, okay, here's your kitchen table. Yeah. Here's your chair. You got your baby put over here. Tell your dog to be quiet over here in this corner. I'm going to teach you how to work out with a chair, a kitchen table and just your body. So yes, I, I'll agree with you there. You can work out inside under any situation in your one room apartment, but it's difficult. And I think I really believe in, in working out six to seven days a week and you do need to change it up. That's just a fact of life. Um, another thing that I, I haven't had a chance to ask you just as my pal and doctor, where are we at right now? Again, because it seems to change every day. Talk to me about, um, surfaces and talk to me about what is now scientifically presumed transmission. So I'm hearing things about certainly contact like if, and, and different types of surface. So cardboard I'm hearing now is more dangerous and, and metal like metal doorknobs. So if I have the virus and I you know cough into my hand and I touch that doorknob, that virus could potentially live on that doorknob for up to 24, 48 hours or more. Is that correct? Can you take me through that a little bit? I think um, the virus does have a very long life outside the body, and it can be a couple, two, three days on smooth surfaces. Porous surfaces, and cardboard would be an example of that, cloth would be an example of that, um, the lifespan will be probably closer to less than 24 hours. Okay. So, you know, I think you can go accordingly. And it, it's difficult, even watching doctors, it's very, very difficult to properly sterilize, to properly uh, make sure you're not touching anything. You think about, okay, a friend comes over, uh, you know, somebody comes over to clean your house. You um, go to the grocery store, you put groceries that you got in the grocery store in a bag, then you have to decide now what do you do now that they're in your trunk you know have they contaminated where where are things going to go worst case scenario because everybody's seen that guy coughing and spitting on that box that he was delivering for amazon.com yep. for prime and you have to kind of always assume worst case scenario but i i think you know there's a point of overage as well it's like you know you can only go so far and, you know, when you're looking at a 90% rate where people just bounce right back from this, if you go too far and you drive yourself crazy, you know, you know, I'm not so sure that being to the, and I've got some people that, you know, have done everything perfectly, but it's, it's a huge emotional toll. And, you know, you really have to weigh the pros and cons. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and it's also just this, this fear of, the food, you know, take, take out food, which is hurting that. I mean, the economy is so across the board suffering so badly that, you know, Daisy and I want to get take food out more. We want to we want to support those businesses. But then there's also a little thing in the back of our minds where we're like, OK, well, we have to really wipe down the, the cardboard container. We, we don't ever eat anything out of the container. We transfer it and we're constantly washing our hands. And. Um, but let me give you an example of, you know, another statistical analysis. I mean, I think that we can all agree to a certain limit that pesticides are not good for you. Right. So, but when people have really looked at the, the benefit of organic food, which is something, they come down to, if your typical grocery store is three blocks away, but you have to drive two miles to get to a place to buy organic, you're paying more, so that's making you work a little bit more. And just the extra two miles you drive to get the organic food, the chance of death in that two-mile trip may equal the increased chance of death from, you know, Alizar being sprayed on your, on your apples. So we have to look at what's the damage being done by all these chemicals being used? What's the damage being done by latex? There are some people with severe allergies to latex. Yeah. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to poo-poo 
safety because, you know, I use every possible protective bit of gear uh, possible to try to protect myself. However, I think that we have to recognize that there are dangers to putting chemicals around your house and, you know, being exposed to latex con constantly. So I just want to put it in the equation so that we can have a fair discussion about it. I understand. Um, where do you, today, Dr. Fauci, the latest quote from him is he predicts minimum 100,000 deaths in America over the next couple of weeks. Based upon what you're seeing, hearing, reading, where do you, where do you, see, where do you see things a week from now and where do you see things a month from now? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, you can't estimate the number of deaths because we still don't quite know how effective the social distancing and the lockdowns are going to be eventually, number one. Number two is we can't estimate deaths when we're just now starting to get a grip on these new antiviral therapies and anti- Overnight game changer. Correct. Right. So that if, if, these, if these studies show that some of these drugs, which in my small use have shown a little bit of promise, um, if we can show that we have a solution for, you know, the virus to a certain extent, that totally changes the number. So I'm not a big fan of predicting that. I know that we can say, let's, let's not be quite so panicked. I mean, I, I really am not a fan of the news. I've watched it a little bit. And I think that they're emphasizing negatives they're, they're being honest, but I don't think anybody is talking about, for instance, other infectious disease threats we face, you know? Yeah. Uh, number one, influenza probably just killed 30,000 people. There, there was very little uh, fear or fear mongering about that. Again, it's, it's a despicable number and we need to do better, but no one was on the news saying, you're all gonna die, you better wipe down your groceries. That's number one. Number two, people don't know what the background death rate is in this country and it's substantial. Number three, people don't know how many people are dying from poor lifestyle choices. And I think that's something that would be also very helpful to hear. And to your point, yeah, there, there may be some choice, but a lot of health style is a choice. There's certain genetic tendencies and I think we need to speak to that. And then let's just talk about straight out infections. Where is the anguish when literally in the past, hundreds of thousands of uh, HIV individuals were dying? People weren't concerned. The stock market didn't go down one bump and it was mass suffering and pain. Yeah. And it was scary for me as a doctor. There was nothing heard about that. Where is the, where is the discussion about this massive jumping of gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis rates? This year alone, and it'll probably go down now, so this number is no longer active now that social distancing is changing the way human beings hook up. Yeah. But without the COVID thing, there were 25 million Americans that were gonna be affected from an, a sexually transmitted disease, as I was talking to you about in my last book. Yeah. Not one word about that. No one wants to read about that. No one is interested in that. Why are we so interested in this infection and you know, sexually transmitted diseases, which we could very frankly address simultaneously with this horrible infection. Yeah. But there, we don't have the mojo to do that. And it just, it's curious to me Why how we get, pick what, what, certain your, diseases. Sorry, excuse ahead. me? No, I'm sorry. It, it's, it's curious to me why we pick certain diseases and we're scared and we're going to mobilize this amazing effort, which I'm all behind. But wait, where's the effort for these other infectious diseases that are literally sterilizing, maiming. Do you know how many kids are, are being brain affected by syphilis? Yeah. I mean, this is a disease that should have been cured in the 1950s. Where is the outrage about that? Where's the outrage about the 14,000 people a year that will die from uh, HPV? How come HPV we have a vaccine for? How come less than 40% of the people that could benefit from HPV, a disease that will kill 14,000 Americans this year, Where's the outrage there? Why aren't people getting vaccinated for that? We have a treatment for it and people aren't doing it. But now we're desperate for a vaccine for this disease. I, I don't get it. It's schizophrenic to me. But, okay, having written a, a really well-written book about that particular topic very recently, you tell me, why do you think, is it simply the, the focus of the media? Is it simply, what's your take on, why is this getting the attention it's getting when those things which 
have been going on and affecting countless people for years is not has never gotten the same treatment. What's I'll, your I'll tell you straight out. I had a discussion with a doctor who has a massive TV show, and he said, Rob, our ratings go down when we talk about sexually transmitted diseases. I love you. It's a great book. No one's going to have you on TV to talk about sexually transmitted diseases. It doesn't get ratings. People go, that's other people. Meanwhile, they have the STD. Everybody has an STD in this country. They just want to deny that they, right. they don't know they have HPV, but everybody's got that. So people don't want to watch a show about STDs. However, this is a ratings night. This is a ratings gold mine for you know, people know. have multiple the hours of yeah, COVID transmitted TV shows. So it's a rating gold mine because it's a good disease and good people get it. And so they can talk about it. STDs is the last kind of hidden, socially unaccepted thing to talk about. That's a really, really good point. That's a really good point. Um, I think I, I, it's important for me because I think we skipped past it. Earlier on, I asked you about, are, you, are the tests or the amount of tests that you needed that everybody was talking about were not available. Are they more available now? Is testing as they're available? They're more available, but they're still unavailable. We are fighting. We have to get on our hands and knees to get the nasal swabs to do the culture. We have everything else. Um, and how reliable is that test? Excuse me? How reliable is that test? The test is not that reliable. If I do a swab on you, if you come to me and say, Rob, I've got a cough, I've got a fever, and I do the swab and I say, you're positive. That's incredibly accurate. If I say you don't have it, that's not that accurate because the test only is truly, it, it picks up 70% of the people that have it. So 30% plus wow. or minus of the people with COVID-19 will be told they have a negative test on the first test. Wow, unbelievable. And no one wants to talk about that either. I, I never see that discussed on TV. And so people come in with these unrealistic expectations and think when they have a negative, okay, I'm, I'm scot free, which is not true, unfortunately. That's a really important point. I'm glad, I'm glad you mentioned that. Well, is there anything else you wanna cover before we- uh... Just, uh, I just, you know, it's, it's a good thing because you can have your hair messy because you're always putting those uh, masks and eye goggles on. So we don't have to, you don't have to look good. You can wear kind of old beat up clothes because we have these gowns on all the time. So, uh, there are a few silver linings to this whole pandemic. Well, aside, look, I mean, aside from the, correct me if I'm wrong, but aside from the chaos that you're dealing with in your profession, you're one of the, I mean, it's chaotic and it's over the top, but it doesn't look different and it won't look different a month from now or six months from now. Whereas, and if everything from what I do to so many other people, like everything is potentially going to look a lot different in terms of business, in terms of moving there's forward. There's going to be a post-COVID-19 world and it's going to be different than what we had. There's going to be yeah. kind of a new levels of technology. I think people are going to think about groups together in a different light. And, you know, God forbid, people will think about other infectious disease. Maybe this will have a, a dribble down effect and people will actually talk about other serious widespread diseases that we have in this country. Yeah. Yeah. I hope you're right. All Dude, right. Be safe. Uh, yeah. You too. And, um, you know, you, you, as you know, I've always admired you, never more so than now. You are, you are doing, that. you're doing very courageous work right now and you have my deep respect. Cool, appreciate it. Okay, good talking. Bye-bye.